Good morning and welcome to this session of the Tourette Association's virtual conference. I'm Angela Sullivan, Medical Project Specialist at the Tourette Association of America. Thank you for joining us for the present and future of therapeutics for TS. We would like to take this opportunity to thank our conference platinum sponsors, Emilex and David Amundsen, our diamond sponsor, Oracle, as well as our donors and supporters for making this free conference possible. To help us continue to provide educational program like this, please consider making a donation. Your gift in any amount will assist the Tourette Association of America in continuing to provide critical support and resources to the Tourette syndrome and tic disorder community. Please visit Tourette.org slash donate to make a contribution today. During today's session, we would be very happy to hear from you and include your voice in the conversation. You may ask questions or share comments using the question panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar player at any time. We will collect your questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Also, the slides for this presentation are available to download under the handouts panel on your GoToWebinar player. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our presenters, Dr. Irene Malati, Dr. Rebecca Lehman, and Dr. Juhi jimenez Shahed. Dr. Malati is an associate professor in the Department of Neurology at the Fixel Institute for Neurological Diseases at University of Florida Movement Disorders. Dr. Lehman is an associate professor of clinical pediatrics at Prisma Health Midlands, University of South Carolina in Columbia, South Carolina. And Dr. Jimenez Shahed is an associate professor of neurology and neurosurgery at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. All of our presenters this morning are very active members of TAA's Medical Advisory Board. Without further ado, Dr. Malati, please go ahead and begin the presentation. Good morning, everybody. We're so happy to be able to join. We hope everybody's healthy and we're happy you're able to take some time to learn about Tourette syndrome. I'm just trying to... Angela, I'm not sure if it's... There we go. All right. So this is going to be a team taught session. We're going to cover medications, experimental therapeutics, cannabis, and DBS. So I'm Irene Malati from University of Florida, as you heard, and I'll be talking about the established treatment spectrum with regard to medications. Uh, disclosures relate to the things we do besides what we're doing right now. So I participate in research with a lot of different, um, a lot of different movement disorders. None of these things will be discussed today, and I receive honorary. Uh, for giving talks and teaching about movement disorders, as well as for a book I've written about Parkinson's. And I will be discussing off-label medications. So that means things that are not FDA approved for Tourette syndrome. So in our time together, we'll talk about deciding, first of all, whether to start medication. Secondly, we'll talk about what the options are. And we'll touch on the American Academy of Neurology's guidelines, which tell us about how much evidence there is in support of different options. And you'll have a dedicated session to those guidelines. So we'll just use this as an opportunity to weave that throughout our discussion of which medicines to choose. So the natural history of Tourette syndrome is that sometimes attention difficulty may emerge first. Motor tics commonly emerge before vocal, but not always and other symptoms can come later in the course. Most commonly tics present in the five to eight year old range and may worsen in the 10 to 12 year old range um, and sometimes get better or go away eventually. Not always, but sometimes. And so some people ask, should they be treated with medication if sometimes they may get better on their own? So there are a lot of considerations in whether or not to use medication. The first one relates to who is the patient. And what I mean by that is sometimes the, the family members or the significant others of people with Tourette syndrome suspect that it's more bothersome than the individual really feels like it is. And that's not irrelevant, it's still important, but we always wanna go back to is the individual actually bothered by the tics. By bothered, there are many factors that come to play. One of those is whether the tics are socially bothersome. That can relate to bullying or peer relationships. Do the tics interfere with academic or professional life? So sometimes tics can be a distraction from learning. Sometimes suppressing tics can be a distraction from learning or performing at work. Are the tics painful? So some tics like strong whiplash tics can be um, painful or even dangerous. And so if a person has tics that are causing them 
pain, we sometimes prioritize controlling those. How severe are the ticks? And severe is kind of relative. So for some people, really strong and intrusive trick ticks are not too bothersome. And for other people, what look like mild ticks may be disruptive. So severe is really in the, um, in the interpretation of the person with the ticks. And finally, there are aspects that are less obviously measurable, like self-esteem. So it's not always a physical measure of how bad is a tick, but how is it impacting the person? So when we do decide that ticks need to be treated with medications, there are some major principles to consider. One of those is to prioritize which symptoms are causing the most difficulty. So we talked about that many people with ticks may also have difficulties with attention, with anxiety, with obsessive compulsive symptoms. And so we have to look at which of those things is causing the greatest difficulty. If the problem is inability to focus or complete tasks, and impulsivity, then we might think about treating ADHD before focusing on the ticks. Sometimes treating anxiety can help reduce the ticks too, so we always prioritize the biggest problem. Secondly, we have to have realistic expectations. It's not common that a medicine will make ticks be completely absent. The goal is to reduce them and improve quality of life rather than really expecting complete resolution, although that is desired. And finally, and the greatest challenge, is to give medications an adequate therapeutic trial. That means giving the medicine enough time to take effect and actually giving it an opportunity for the dose to be adjusted. This is difficult because ticks fluctuate with time, and if you interpret what happens with a medicine in the first day or two, you can be fooled by natural fluctuations in ticks, and even the anxiety of starting a new medicine can sometimes cause a temporary increase it's much more effective to give medicines a few weeks to take effect and allow the dose to be adjusted until the best benefit is achieved, as long as there are no side effects. So these are the classes of medications that we use. We will go through these individually. These may not be every medicine that's ever been used, but these are the most commonly ones, uh, most commonly used ones and the ones that have some evidence to support their use. So the first class are the alpha-2 receptor agonists clonidine and guanfacine. These medications are not the most effective or the most potent for ticks, but they're relatively well tolerated and the side effects are not as scary as some other medications, so we commonly start here. The, you can see that they go by the brand names that are written on the slide. Clonidine comes in a patch form and a pill form and guanfacine in pill form. And for the, because this is a mixed audience, we have both healthcare professionals, people with ticks, we also have teachers and other people who care about people with ticks. So I have written on the slide some of the evidence um, related to how the medicines are chosen. An RCT stands for randomized controlled trial. This is a kind of experimental strategy where two different groups or even three groups sometimes, sometimes even four, are given different doses and one may be given placebo or a medicine of a different type that's known to work. So they can compare objectively which groups did better or worse and decide if a medicine works. So the tricky thing is both clonidine and guanfacine have multiple trials supporting that they suppress ticks and also some negative trials where they didn't show a major benefit. Um, but we're usually starting with these especially in mild to moderate ticks and especially if there's ADHD because occasionally they can help with that too. So the American Academy of Neurology guideline reviewed the evidence and the strength of it and gave a level B um, level of evidence support. So level A is the best, meaning the strongest trials and the most support. B is next, followed by C. So you can use that to kind of uh, recognize how strongly the evidence supports these medicines. An important thing in using these medicines is they should be weaned if they're discontinued. If you're on the very lowest dose, you can stop suddenly, but if the dose has been increased, they have to be weaned. These medicines can lower blood pressure and clonidine is actually used for blood pressure control. And if you stop them suddenly, you could see an increase in blood pressure or even a rebound in ticks or anxiety. And on the slides, I've written the common doses that are started and targeted so that you can refer to those in your slide sets. The most commonly used class probably are the neuroleptics. They also go by the name antipsychotics because they're used to treat psychosis in a different, in a different way. So these medicines block dopamine receptors 
and they are uh, have good potency in suppressing ticks, but they also have a longer list of side effects that we have to watch for. The ones on the left are the older or first generation neuroleptics, and the ones on the right are the second generation or newer neuroleptics. The difference is the newer ones have less tight binding to a particular dopamine receptor called the D2 receptor, and that helps them have hopefully less chance of causing some of the movement-related side effects I'll tell you about. The only medicines approved for Tourette syndrome in the US are haloperidol and pimazide, and in children, we add aripiprazole. But because these medicines have significant side effects to watch for, we often don't use them first, even though they are FDA approved. And these are the dose ranges um, that have been used for starting doses and targeted doses for these medications. But let's talk about the possible risks. And we don't have clear data that one is better than another. There's more or less data for different ones. So the possible side effects, the most common are somnolence, meaning tiredness or low energy and weight gain. And we have to watch that very closely because with weight gain come other risks like elevated cholesterol, and blood sugar. So we have to monitor that. Uh, temperature dysregulation, people could have hot flashes. When you suppress dopamine, you can increase a hormone caused prolactin, and this can cause some unusual side effects like in men or boys, accumulation of breast tissue called gynecomastia, and in girls, leaking of milk for the breast from the breast called galactorrhea or disruption of the menstrual cycle, amenorrhea. So we watch for these things. You can actually test for prolactin, um, and you can also monitor for these side effects clinically, meaning watching for them. Low blood pressure can occur in some of them. Heart rhythm changes, and specifically, there's one called prolonged QT interval, which has to do with um, an effect that some medications can have, especially if you're on more than one, that can even be risky of a dangerous life-threatening heart rhythm. So in certain medications, we actually will check an EKG before and after starting therapy to be sure that we're not seeing any evidence of that. Some people could experience depression on neuroleptics, and we monitor for that. Of course, Tourette syndrome can cause depression in itself, too. There are also some movement-related side effects that we call extrapyramidal reactions. Extrapyramidal means they're not caused because of changes in the way the motor pathways work, but rather the way that they're functioning. So these can be acute dystonic reaction, which can be a muscle tightening or tensing, um, akathisia, which is a restlessness, Neuroleptic malignant syndrome is a rare side effect where people could have elevated temperature and elevated blood pressure and stiffness, usually when they start or increase a medicine, very rare. And importantly, tardive dyskinesia or withdrawal dyskinesia. This is most commonly seen when people have been treated with neuroleptics for many years, and it can be a different involuntary movement that's not a tick, and it can even be permanent after a medicine is stopped. So we're very careful and we try to avoid this by using the lowest dose that does the job. Fortunately, this is very rare in individuals with Tourette syndrome. It's not impossible, but it is rare. And one retrospective study, meaning looking backwards at people who were on these medicines who had Tourette, looked at over 500 people and didn't have a case um, in their database. It does occur, but it's very rare. And so we have to consider that when we choose a medication. So you'll, go, you'll have a session dedicated to this, but the AAN guidelines suggest that these medications have a level C support, which means they may be used when the benefit outweighs the risk, and that patients should be counseled about the possible side effects, physicians should monitor for those, they should use the lowest dose possible, and especially with pimazide or zipracidone, a, an EKG should be checked to be sure that the QT interval, meaning the part of the EKG blip, um, the specific segment is not getting longer on the therapy. Another medication that has been used is called tetrabenazine. This medication works on the dopamine system, which we think is on overdrive in Tourette, but in a different way. So the blue dots in the picture are dopamine, and the red circle is a vesicle where it gets taken into a vesicle so that it can be released here 
at the nerve terminal. So this is the nerve sending a signal to the other one. And this VMAT is vesicular monoamine transporter is a receptor where the dopamine vesicles can, can get in and get out, get sent to the other side. And if you block them getting into this, this area, then they can't get to the other side. So we call this presynaptic. It's blocking dopamine on this side, whereas the dopamine receptor blockers block it on the bottom side. So it's kind of coming at it from a different direction. This medicine's only approved in the US for Huntington disease, but it's been used in Tourette syndrome. Um, it wasn't rated by the AN because it only has open label studies, which means everyone knew that they were getting it. And those kinds of studies have a strong placebo response, meaning people tend to think they're better because they know they're getting something. Um, there's also backward looking studies saying, if I look at my patients on it, then I report how they did with it. And so there is some evidence um, and it can be used. The main problems with this medicine are that we have to watch for excessive tiredness because it doesn't only deplete dopamine, it also depletes norepinephrine and it also depletes serotonin, which can lead to depression. So we have to watch for depression or even suicidality on this medicine and we can only use it if depression is under good control or not present. We also watch for slowing down of movements and tremors. One of the advantages of this medicine is less weight gain so that can be um, a useful strategy. It can be hard to get because it's not approved for Tourette syndrome, but it is an option. Topiramate or Topamax um, is a medication that's been used for seizures and migraines. It goes by the other trade names here too. And there are multiple studies that show some benefit in some cases, even similar to the neuroleptics, but in a meta-analysis, meaning if someone looked at all the research available, they felt that the overall evidence wasn't strong enough to give it a, a support. The AAN gave it a level B recommendation that said should be prescribed if benefit outweighs the risk. The side effects we watch for are tiredness, tingling in the fingertips or toes, problems with loss of appetite and weight loss instead of weight gain, trouble thinking of the word a person wants to say, and there's a small increase in the risk of glaucoma or kidney stones. So if a person has had those, then it's a medicine to avoid. A few other options have been used. GABAergic medicine means medicine that works on GABA, a different neurotransmitter that has inhibitory effects. So the class called benzodiazepines includes things like clonazepam, uh, medicines you may have heard of by the names of Xanax or Ativan. We rarely use these, but they can help reduce anxiety. And the issue is they can be habit forming they can cause tiredness or cloudy thinking and balance trouble. So we use those with great caution. Baclofen is also used as a muscle relaxer and rarely has been used for people with tics. Botulinum toxin that some people know by the brand name Botox, which is one of four brands that makes botulinum toxin, is used uh, occasionally for vocal tics, loud coprolalia, which are tics of socially um, unacceptable words or phrases or loud disruptive tics by injecting the vocal cords and it makes them weaker for the way they come together so that sound comes out softer. And so for some people it's preferable to have what we call hypophonia or soft voice than the loud intrusive tics. And those have to be done by a specialist. We also use it for certain focal motor tics, meaning really specific motor tics like blinking or head jerking, where it can be injected in muscles and it may reduce tics and the urge to do those tics based on studies of less than 50 patients. The AN gives this a level C guidance of, of level of evidence support and suggests that in adolescents and adults with bothersome simple motor tics or aggressive vocal tics, it may be used. So in general, to summarize, we always start low with the dose and go slowly. We choose the drug based on the symptoms a person has and the things we need to try to avoid like weight gain and weight loss. We look at the most bothersome symptom and we treat only when necessary with realistic goals and enough time to decide a medicine's working. So how does this pan out? If you have Tourette syndrome, what do you do? Do you look for someone with a pin that says, just trust me, I'm a neurologist or I'm a psychiatrist and just kind of do what they say? There are a lot of different strategies and there's not a one size fits all approach. So the AAN gives us some support of what has strong evidence. And there are published guidelines. This is one by my colleague, Michael Oaken, that suggested starting with behavioral therapies or alpha agonists, moving on to antipsychotics or to pyramate or botulinum toxin, and then moving to tetrabenazine or surgical therapies. But here's a different one. We won't look at it in detail, but just to show you, they put it in a totally different order. 
and they used different medications than the first one. So there are lots of different ways and you really want to have a physician who has experience and knowledge of Tourette to kind of guide you. So if you are on a medicine, you might ask, do I need to be on it forever? Well, the AEN gives a level A recommendation, the strongest to say, you need to periodically reevaluate the need for continued medical treatment. So if there's a long period of remission, then we talk about, is this a good time to reduce medicine slightly and see if it's still needed? Some people stay on medicine forever and that's okay too, but it's important to at least consider it. So thank you for your attention. We'll have a dedicated time in the end for questions. I'm gonna turn over this presentation now to Dr. Lehman, who's gonna talk about investigational strategy for Tourette syndrome. And Dr. Lehman, you should have control of the presentation. All right, let's see. There we go. All right. So, um, so my name is Rebecca Lehman. Um, as was mentioned before, I am a, a pediatric neurologist at Prisma Health Midlands, which is affiliated with the University of South Carolina in Columbia, South Carolina. And I'm going to talk today about some of the treatments that are currently under investigation, um, kind of in the pipeline for uh, Tourette syndrome. Uh, just a quick mention of my disclosures. Um, I have served as um, either a sub investigator or a principal investigator for some of the studies that I'm going to be talking about today, but did not receive direct financial compensation for, um, for my role in those studies. Um, I was compensated for um, uh, being on the medical advisory board for Teva um, and as well as for travel for medical advisory board meetings and um, CDC related talk, CDC sponsored talks for the Tread Association, as well as for um, a consultancy role with Ascension. Um, by virtue of the fact that I'm talking about investigational agents, everything that I'm talking about is not on label at this point. Sorry, there's a little bit of a lag in my. Hmm. Lads are not wanting to advance. Do you want to pass that off to me one more time, Maureen, or double check that um, it's. Sure. It's got you marked already, but I'm um, I've unclicked it and remarked it, so you should now re have control. If there's any problem, I can just advance for you. But I'm gonna do that. I think it's not it's not wanting to let me do it at the moment. So okay, I'll do advance it. Sure. Here we go. Is that? Best laid plans. That's great. Um, okay, so um, so basically, just briefly, the objectives for my portion of the talk are to um, look at the agents that are currently under investigation or in the pipeline for the treatment of Tourette disorder, and to um, look at the uh, mechanisms for these agents to, um, to a, a limited degree that time allows. Go ahead. Well, why do we need these treatments? Um, you know, the, the short answer is that what we have right now is inadequate. It's, um, you know, we've got a good start, um, but our current treatments um, all have relative issues with them. Um, CBIT, which has certainly been shown to be, um, have good efficacy. Um, the main issue has been that there are really a shortage of trained therapists. And obviously the Tread Association is trying to mitigate that problem by training people all over the country, um, but there are still large swaths of area that are underserved for that therapy. Um, the alpha-2 agonists, um, as Dr. Malati just mentioned, um, have had sort of variable efficacy in different studies. Um, they seem to have a, a better effect in people who have comorbid ADHD, um, but sort of a variable response. And then the D2 antagonists, which were the neuroleptics or antipsychotic medications that Dr. Malati was talking about, um, as she mentioned, have a number of side effects or the potential for a number of side effects. So um, obviously we need some better treatment options for folks with tick disorders. Um, and that's why these investigational agents are so important. So kind of a brief overview um, for the non-clinical folks of how clinical trials work. Um, they tend to start um, obviously way back in the um, laboratory and in animal uh, phases, um, but then to move on to trials in, in humans. And that's really the part I'm gonna focus on, which is the clinical trials piece. 
Um, so the earliest studies in humans are really looking at how the body metabolizes the drug and um, then starting to move up to very small numbers of patients to assess the safety of the drug. Um, but I'm going to mostly focus on the later phase trials, the phase two and three trials, which are looking more at um, the effectiveness of the drug and then further evaluating safety in larger numbers of people. There are also what are considered phase four trials, which are actually post-marketing research, um, where we continue to learn more as more people are exposed to a medication, but I'm, I'm not going to be discussing those today. So um, how, when, we're, when we're doing these trials, um, most of the trials are sharing the same endpoint, meaning um, that their primary thing that they're looking for to show benefit of their medication is typically using the Yale Global Tick Severity Scale. And this scale um, is a clinician-administered scale of tick severity. It has two subscale sub scores, let's say that five times fast, um, that um, are looking at motor tick severity and then vocal tick severity or phonic tick severity. Um, and I, both of those will total to 25 um, and with ratings for the number of ticks in that category, how often the ticks are happening during the day, how intense or forceful or noticeable those ticks are, um, the complexity of the ticks, um, how many muscle groups or um, sounds, the complexity of the sounds that are involved, um, and then how they're interfering with the person's function. Are they interrupting or, or disrupting for long periods of time things that they're trying to do like talking, walking, writing, et cetera. So, um, so the scale ranges when you total it up um, to from zero to 50 with um, 50 being, oh, let me back up for one more second, um, with 50 being most severe. Um, and there's a separate component to the Yale Global Tick Severity Scale that looks at impairment. Um, that's typically separated out. So most of the primary endpoints for these studies really focus on this portion of the score, which is the total tick severity score. Um, apparently I have control back again. Um, so um, looking at the investigational agents um, that we're going to talk about today, um, I'm going to make a little bit more mention of some of the VMAT2 inhibitors that Dr. Malati was um, speaking about, and specifically looking at two that have been under investigation recently, valbenazine and dutetrabenazine. Um, I'm going to speak about a D D1 dopamine receptor antagonist. Um, Cannabis-related compounds are obviously of great interest for a number of neurological disorders, including Tourette syndrome. Um, I'm not going to speak about those as much because those are going to be um, covered in the next portion of this talk. Um, but I will mention some uh, serine hydrolase um, and also an NMDA receptor partial coagonist. There's a few other agents or, or processes that are under investigation right now, um, a Chinese medicinal formula, um, selective microbiota, microbiota transplantation and um, transcranial magnetic stimulation that I won't have an opportunity to cover today um, just due to the limits of time. Uh, it's my understanding that transcranial magnetic stimulation is going to be covered um, in other sessions. So, um, so the, we've already sort of covered with, in Dr. Malati's talk the um, VMAT2 inhibitors in terms of how they work, but again, just briefly, um, the neurochemicals, neurotransmitters like dopamine and other monoamines, so norepinephrine um, and others like serotonin, histamine, are packaged into these little vesicles or envelopes inside the presynaptic neuron, um, which is the kind of first cell in a first brain cell in a chain of brain cells that are trying to talk to each other. And so um, in order to get into these little packages, um, it has to be passed through the VMAT2 inhibitor um, or sorry, the VMAT2 receptor. Um, the VMAT2 inhibitors block that receptor so that the, the chemicals, including dopamine, cannot enter these little envelopes and therefore cannot be dumped out into the synapse, which is the space between the two brain cells um, and, and cannot drift over to these receptors on the postsynaptic brain cell, the second one in the chain, to deliver their signal. Um, so, the, the VMAT2 inhibitors are depleting the um, chemicals in those little packages. Um, looking at the recent trials of the VMAT2 inhibitors, 
So tetrabenazine um, has an orphan drug designation for Tourette syndrome in children and adolescents. Um, as mentioned, it doesn't have full FDA approval because it has not undergone the kind of randomized controlled trials that um, the FDA likes to see for that. Um, but tetrabenazine has some limitations. It's an immediate release formulation and it tends to reach kind of peak levels in the body very quickly. And because of that, um, it also gets broken down very quickly. And so because of that, um, it tends to cause more side effects when it's at its peak in terms of um, drowsiness and, um, and sometimes the restlessness or akathisia. Um, and then also needs to be dosed relatively frequently, ideally um, three times a day. So both of those are sort of limiting factors and a reason that, um, that there's been a, a, the desire to find other agents that might um, have more favorable um, features to them. So um, two different medications have been investigated recently. Um, valbenazine, which um, was sponsored by Neurocrine, um, the T-Force Gold and T-Force Platinum trials were the two most recent that were in children and adolescents. And these were phase two trials. Um, and the, the first T-Force Gold was a dose optimization study. So they had 127 children and they, um, in the first six weeks of the study, they could move up on the dose they were taking at weeks two and weeks four. And then the next six weeks, they were held at that steady dose that they had reached um, and then uh, tapered off and monitored over the following two weeks. So 12 weeks and then um, two weeks post-treatment. Um, and unfortunately, that study failed to meet its primary endpoint, um, so affecting that Yale Global Tick Severity Scale. Um, the T-Force Platinum study had a different design. It was what was called a randomized withdrawal study. So everyone actually started on the investigational agent and then partway through the study, some of the patients were being um, uh, taken off of the investigational product and onto placebo, a sugar pill. Um, but uh, the patient or parent and the, the investigator did not know who was continuing on the medication and who was not. Um, and that study was stopped early for futility. It was not um, in the, in the, when they had analyzed the data from the early patients in that trial, as well as the data that was still emerging from the preceding T-Force Gold trial, um, Neurocrine um, opted to discontinue that study. Um, a, and so that, the valbenazine agent is um, related to tetrabenazine in the sense that it is actually a pro-drug or a parent drug of one of tetrabenazine's metabolites. So tetrabenazine gets broken down into a couple of active chemicals and valbenazine is actually the parent drug to one of those active chemicals with just a, a one amino acid um, uh, changed to a valine. And that makes it, the, the advantage to that one is that it's once daily dosing. The artists one and two trials were looking at a different agent, dutetrabenazine, which is also related to tetrabenazine. Um, it's just that it's a, a modified tetrabenazine where there are two deuterium um, hydrogens, which are heavy hydrogens that bind more tightly um, that affect the metabolism of the dutetrabenazine. So they both um, kind of, the idea is that it sort of reduces the fluctuations, um, slows the time to that peak, uh, peak levels in the blood and also um, prolongs the activity of the drug. Um, again, allowing for twice daily dosing and, and ideally um, fewer side effects. So these um, studies which were conducted by Teva, um, one was a flexible dose study that then had an open label extension where patients could um, continue on the medication. Um, and then a subsequent fixed dose study where everyone was held at a single do um, or at specific dose um, both of those also unfortunately failed to meet their primary endpoints. So thus far, at least in the pediatric and adolescent um, uh, population or child and adolescent population, the um, BMAT2 inhibitors have sort of had disappointing results um, for reasons that are still um, being elucidated with further analyses of some of that data. One of the other kind of side points about these medications um, is that they're extremely expensive, which, um, you know, kind of even if we put aside the sort of disappointing results, as I was mentioning, you know, even if they come to market or are showing benefit, um, one of the limiting factors may be the fact that these are um, extremely costly medications. 
To move on to another uh, another group that's under trial right now, I'm um, looking at D1 antagonists. So we've talked a little bit about D2 antagonists, those neuroleptic um, medications or antipsychotic medications. Um, Dopamine is believed to be one of the core neurotransmitters involved with Tourette syndrome, but thus far all of our focus has been on the D2 receptors. There are actually two different types of dopamine receptors in the brain, um, both of which are, are heavily um, represented in the basal ganglia, which is a, a, deep, a collection of deep structures in the brain that are felt to be um, uh, the source of or kind of intimately involved with ticks. Um, and so the, the D1 receptors thus far have not been um, targeted with um, any sort of medications. And so this is sort of an exciting first-in-class uh, medication. So um, the DIAMOND trial right now is ongoing um, of a D1 receptor antagonist called Echopipam. This is being sponsored by Amalex and is a phase two study. Um, it's a multi-center placebo-controlled um, double-blind, um, randomized, parallel group study, meaning that um, one group of subjects is assigned to the um, echopipam arm and one group is assigned to a placebo arm, and they stay in that arm through the entire study. Um, this study is currently recruiting and it is underway, so um, looking forward to hearing the results of this one as they become available. Moving on to the um, serine um, hydrolases. So the serine hydrolases are focusing, even though I'm not going to talk about the um, cannabinoids and how they're used in Tourette because that's going to be covered, I'm going to talk a little bit about them in the sense that the serine hydrolases are really modifying what's called the endocannabinoid system. So the endocannabinoid system is a biological system that is composed of cannabinoid receptors, which are CB1 and CB2. Um, and then the endocannabinoids themselves, which are the, the, the actual um, neurochemicals, and then the, the enzymes that help to break those endocannabinoids down when they're done being used. Um, and so the main function of the endocannabinoid system is that um, it, it has um, the ability to modulate a number of other brain transmitter systems, a number of other neurotransmitter systems. So it's sort of regulating all, a number of other systems, um, dopamine systems, but also many other neurotransmitters. Um, and so there are these, there are two different types of cannabinoid receptors. There are the CB1 receptors, which are most heavily represented in the brain, but are found a number of other places in the body as well. And the CB2 receptors, um, which are most heavily represented in the immune system, but again, are found in other areas. And the way these receptors work is they're actually on the presynaptic cell and they create a, a feedback um, where the postsynaptic cell, the second cell in a chain, um, is, is releasing these chemicals, um, AEA and 2AG. And I, I won't um, try to say those names repeatedly, the full names, but um, 2 arachidonoglycerol, so 2AG. And they um, go back and they interact with these receptors, the CB1 receptors on the um, first cell, the presynaptic cell, um, to help regulate or modulate how that cell is acting. And when those chemicals are done um, and have completed their job, they are taken up by um, other cells that are kind of surrounding the neurons, surrounding the brain cells called glial cells, and then broken down um, by one of a couple pathways. One of those pathways that can break them down is through this enzyme called monoacylglycerol lipase, and it breaks it down to a chemical called glycerol that's no longer active. So the serine hydrolases are actually um, blocking this enzyme, which prevents the breakdown of this active agent, this 2-AG. So it keeps it kind of floating around more, able to act more. Um, and so there is an agent that's currently under investigation. It doesn't have a fancy name yet, so it goes by this sort of long um, LUAG 06466. And it actually was the same agent that was formerly under a different name. Um, it was originally investigated by Abide Therapeutics, but um, Abide was purchased by Lundbeck in uh, last spring. And so um, Lundbeck now um, has uh, rights to this agent and is in doing further investigations. They recently completed a phase 2A study 
that was a multi-center randomized double blind placebo controlled study where there was some individual dose titration they could move up on the doses this was done in adults um, and unfortunately um, they did not see a statistically significant difference um, favoring the medical the investigational product at days 28 or 56. Um, the most common side effects that they were reporting were fatigue, disturbance of attention, um, nasopharyngitis, so kind of cold-type symptoms, um, and paresthesias, which are tingly sensations. So um, they, from, from what they've published thus far, they are planning further investigations, and they're still optimistic about this um, particular pathway and how it might be involved in threat. Um, and then finally, I'm um, looking at um, decycloserine. So um, the NMDA receptors are, again, widely represented through the brain. They're thought to play a role in neuroplasticity, which is sort of how different brain circuits um, form or remodel themselves over time and in learning. Um, and so um, in order to be active, these, these receptors have to have glutamate bind to them and then also glycine. But instead of glycine, um, decycloserine can sort of bind here at this site and um, increase the activity of that channel. And the idea in this last study um, is that um, the, uh, Dr. Joseph McGuire at UCLA is pairing a single dose of cycloserine with a single um, session of brief habit reversal training to um, see if people actually have a quicker or more enhanced learning of the therapy techniques. Um, so kind of an interesting um, approach there. So in summary, we have a need for effective, well-tolerated therapies. Um, the recent studies of the VMAT2 inhibitors, valbenazine and dutetrabenazine in children, in, in children and adolescents, as well as the serine hydrolase um, in adults with Tourette have failed to meet their primary endpoints. Um, uh, but there are also some other um, products that are under investigation currently, including Echopipam, the D1 receptor antagonist, um, which is a first-in-class agent, and decycloserine, which is an NMDA receptor partial coagonist. Um, so with that, I will pass things off to Dr. Jimenez Shahid, and um, I'll see if I think Irene will pass the torch there. Yes. I think you have to unmute. You should have control, Dr. Shahid. With, okay. Can you there guys we, hear me now? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. I wanted to thank my uh, co-presenters for their excellent presentations. I'm going to wrap up this session with a brief overview of the current status of cannabinoids and surgical treatments for Tourette. And I'm going to focus primarily on efforts that the Tourette Association is, is also involved in. Uh, and you'll see some uh, references to uh, either publications or um, things that have uh, emanated from, from the work that they have supported. Um, so uh, briefly, um, the first part that we'll talk about are cannabinoids. I think Dr. Lehman did a great job of, of presenting what these are and what the endocannabinoid system is. We know that there are two main cannabinoids in the cannabis plant. And so some of you are familiar with this breakdown between THC and CBD. THC is the component that has the strong psychoactive effects and usually is the part that uh, when people are looking for the high or talking about the high from uh, marijuana or cannabis products, uh, this is responsible uh, for for that. And then CBD is the um, uh, compound that can still have effects on the cannabinoid system, but without causing the high or maybe even uh, combating some of the high that's associated with the THC. And people are generally familiar with three types of uses of cannabinoids. You can certainly have recreational cannabinoids that people, as we said, are using to get the high effect. You can have medicinal cannabinoids that are prescribed to relieve the symptoms of a particular medical condition. And you can certainly, uh, there are now some synthetic cannabinoids that are molecules that have been specifically designed to mimic the effects of THC, but without having um, the other consequences of it. 
And so uh, when we think about this endocannabinoid system, I think this is a very similar picture to what was shown by Dr. Lehman. It's a system that has unique com communications uh, within the brain. It affects very uh, a variable uh, number of different important functions. And we all have natural cannabinoid molecules within our bodies. And so these are uh, compounds that are important for regulating things like mood, memory, sleep, appetite, et cetera. And that is why we get not just the effects that people are familiar with from these compounds, but also some of the side effects. So if we look what, at what some of those are, in the top bubble here, you have the uh, effects that people are generally associating with the good effects or, or the effects that they're looking for from cannabinoids. These are things like feelings of euphoria, feelings of well-being, uh, sometimes spontaneous laughter and excitement, and in some cases, quiet and reflective mood. Uh, on the other hand, in the right-sided bubble here is the other consequences that can happen um, when cannabinoids are used. There can be an increase in appetite. People may experience dry mouth, worsening of anxiety. Somewhat worrisome is the um, increase in paranoia that certain patients may experience and also the loss of memory. These are generally effects that we know can happen in adults who are using cannabinoids. Um, we know that there are potential risks of structural and functional alterations in brain development in children and adolescents. And so we really need to be cautious in interpreting what we know about these drugs and how we apply the use of these drugs to that population of individuals. And we also know that the way that an individual person reacts to these compounds may depend on both the content and the ratio of the cannabinoids and other things that might be present in the cannabis, the route of administration, some potential drug-drug interactions that might be present, and also some uh, patient-specific factors that might make a particular individual uh, more prone to certain either effects or side effects of these types of medications. So there's still a lot of information that we uh, need to know about how they work. Now, the endocannabinoid system is highly relevant to Tourette's. As was mentioned, it is important for regulating or modulating uh, other brain transmitters, including dopamine, glutamate, GABA, opioid, acetylcholine, so lots of widespread effects. And in particular with Tourette syndrome, we're concerned with uh, ticks and the basal ganglia, uh, which is a region that uses dopamine, and so it is um, propose that the effect that these types of compounds have on patients with Tourette syndrome relates to its modulation of uh, the dopamine in the basal ganglia. And also, as was mentioned, there may be effects in other places, and that may be the reason why we could see uh, differences in the effect on ADHD, OCD, anxiety, and other comorbidities. The um, anecdotal evidence certainly exists. And for those of us who treat uh, patients with Tourette syndrome have certainly heard from our patients that they can experience benefit uh, and improvements when they either smoke marijuana or take other THC-containing products. And some of the things that people will describe are a reduction in ticks, reduction in the premonitory urges, improvements in sleep, improvements in concentration, helping them relax, and then certainly reductions in the comorbidities such as depression, ADHD, OCD, and rage attack. So while this all is very suggestive that there is some relevance to the use of these types of compounds in Tourette syndrome, this is not really uh, rigorous enough for, for us to be at a point where we can recommend their uh, broad use. There are a couple of randomized trials of cannabinoids in Tourette syndrome. It's important to note that these are very small studies. Uh, the first one here is uh, done in 12 adults with Tourette syndrome, and the second one that's described is uh, done in uh, 24 adults, so, so very small. Um, each of them looked at THC compounds and showed that there was reduction in patient self-reported measures of either tick severity or other features of Tourette syndrome, sometimes a greater benefit in certain areas compared to others. Uh, and so it's a limited literature, a limited amount of comparison being performed, um, and so clearly further investigation is needed. I also want to note that there really is not any scientific publication that addresses the particular effect of CBD alone or CBD as a component of medical marijuana in uh, patients with Tourette syndrome. So we really have kind of a, a gap in our evidence base about that particular compound. The um, 
the, the world has seen a couple of uh, medications that are cannabis based that are specifically in development for Tourette syndrome. And so I mentioned on uh, in the green kind of shading here, the top two, uh, one is uh, a study conducted by Therapex Biosciences of a combination of THC with uh, PEA. And a phase two study has already been concluded that showed a statistically significant reduction in ticks in individuals who were taking uh, this compound. And then Abide Therapeutics has uh, another compound, a synthetic um, uh, thing, uh, compound that stimulates the endocannabinoid system. Uh, and a phase one trial has been completed showing a statistically significant reduction of ticks as well as premonitory urges. So these are both promising. And uh, as their drug development continues, we will continue to uh, expect and, and hope for a further uh, positive results. The bottom two things that I have listed here are uh, investigative efforts that are going on in other countries, one in Germany and the other in Canada. Um, the German study is looking at nabiximals. Nabiximals is actually a cannabinoid that is currently approved outside of the U.S. for management of spasticity associated with multiple sclerosis, but it is a cannabinoid product and they will be investigating its use in adults with chronic tick disorders and Tourette syndrome. And then the Canadian effort is actually looking at um, uh, combinations of THC and CBD, and we'll be looking at how uh, the combination and different ratios might affect uh, individuals and, and specifically adults with Tourette syndrome. So further information, I believe, is, is going to be forthcoming, and we will have a greater evidence base uh, with which to uh, consider their use. So the second part of what I wanted to talk about is uh, deep brain stimulation. I'm going to try to wrap this up here. If we don't get to um, uh, uh, the, the part where we can do some Q&A, we will make sure that we get your questions and answers, or we'll get your questions answered, excuse me. Um, but what is deep brain stimulation? So uh, I think that's a, a, a good place to start for those of you who may not have familiarity with it. Uh, it's important to think of the brain as a network of different circuits. And so there's circuits that control movement, circuits that control memory, circuits that control language. And so movement disorders are diseases that affect how well our movement circuits work. And we know that within the circuitry, there are abnormal firing patterns that create some sort of a disturbance in how that network works. So DBS is a way that we can, with a small electrode, um, deliver an electrical impulse to a very focused area of the brain within uh, the motor circuitry that can then restore them to a more normal level of functioning. And that's a very broad generalization of the efficacy and the effects of DBS. A lot of the molecular details still remain unclear. Um, we also do know that stimulation does not work in the same way that medications do, so you really have to consider them uh, differently. Now, deep brain stimulation has been around uh, for a long time, and certainly in Tourette syndrome has been around for a number of years. The first case report was actually published in 1999. And since that time, we've had a growing body of evidence that suggests that people who have been using this in their patients with Tourette syndrome uh, in a variety of different brain targets and, and likely a variety of, of patients with different um, characteristics. Um, and largely speaking, these reports are small. Um, they do tend to report a beneficial effect on ticks, but they are small studies, they are uncontrolled, and we have a wide variation in the methods and the outcomes that are described. But what it really kind of boils down to is a tale of three targets, and I'll just briefly mention that uh, the CMPF nucleus of the thalamus is um, a uh, location, and I'm sorry if this is not displaying um, correctly, uh, but it's intended to target the motor circuits as well as the limbic circuits. And so we think this may be able to affect Tourette uh, in, um, in, in both of those ways. Whereas the globus pallidus interna can be divided into two sections, the posterior ventral GPI or the anteromedial GPI. The posterior ventral part is um, considered where the motor circuits tend to pass through. And so this target might be particularly effective in, in treating the ticks associated with Tourette syndrome. Um, and then the anteromedial part really houses the limbic circuitry. And so there's thought that that might be um, able to target ticks in a, in a slightly different way, but, but still could be efficacious. And this is where kind of most of the literature uh, boils down uh, into those three targets. Now, there are some recommendations that have been published. I'm not going to go through this in a great amount of detail, but just 
these are recommendations for appropriate patient selection. DBS is not FDA approved for the management of Tourette syndrome, and so there needs to be a great deal of caution that's exercised in, in how we apply this therapy. And so these recommendations can be used to guide um, guide uh, clinicians um, in their thought process about whether DBS is appropriate. But things like making sure patients have uh, ticks as the primary source of disability, uh, that patients have severe ticks that have not previously responded to adequate trials of other interventions, that the other comorbidities that are existing have been uh, either stable or reasonably addressed with alternate uh, therapies, um, and that patients can adhere to uh, the treatment recommendations and kind of the process that's involved in, in deep brain stimulation. So it's not uh, something that should be considered lightly. We need to carefully consider each individual patient and what the risks and benefits of uh, DBS might be. So this is a table that just summarizes the randomized trials of deep brain stimulation. I mentioned to you that most of the studies that have been reported are open label, uh, uncontrolled, uh, either case reports or case series, but there are a handful of actually randomized trials. And this is here for your reference if you want to look at that in greater detail afterwards, but I wanted to point out that when you look at the blinded portion of these investigations, the degree of tick improvement is quite modest and one might wonder why you would consider doing DBS uh, if this is the degree of benefit that you might be seeing. So 6%, 15%, 10%, it doesn't sound uh, very um, convincing as far as efficacy is concerned. However, if you then look at those studies, um, when those patients were allowed to transfer into the open label portion where their treatment uh, could be liberalized and outside of the constraints of, of the blinding uh, components of these trials, you actually see a uh, much uh, greater benefit and, and anywhere from 24 to 80% improvement is what's been described um, in uh, these particular randomized trials. So there's certainly uh, reason to believe that this can be uh, helpful for patients. And that's what brings me to uh, the last piece of the discussion, which is the Tourette syndrome um, stimulation database and registry, which is supported uh, by the Tourette Association. So right now, this is a uh, multi-center kind of worldwide uh, effort uh, for investigators and clinicians who are treating Tourette patients to collaborate together and examine the effects uh, of DBS on their Tourette patients. And so right now we have over 250 participants registered. Uh, these represent um, over 30 centers across the world. Uh, and so a great um, deal, uh, a, a great effort, I think, in terms of bringing everybody together so we can understand this therapy a little bit better. Um, these are some of the baseline characteristics of the cohort that is um, currently enrolled in the registry. It's a predominantly male population, which is what we expect uh, with Tourette syndrome. The mean age at surgery is actually 29, so the vast majority of individuals are getting this as adults. And they have the usual kind of combination of comorbidities. Uh, I'll point out that there's about 20% of these individuals who have self-injurious behaviors, which may uh, be an indicator that this is certainly a more severe uh, population than kind of your general uh, Tourette population uh, that would be treated uh, perhaps medically. And if you look at the brain targets that were described, I just want to point out that the majority of cases are with the thalamic target, followed by uh, the globus pallidus interna, and then a handful of, of other targets that have um, been uh, described and, and patients that have been enrolled in the registry. The um, Across the board, I'll just point out here in this, uh, the, the degree of improvement that was described at six months was about 40%, and then at 12 months that was maintained, possibly even a little bit better at 45%. And if you break that down by target, um, that 40% um, number seems to be uh, what we see. I think the PV GPI group was a lot smaller, and so we have to be a little bit cautious in, in the interpretation of this apparently lesser uh, result. And from a side effect standpoint, um, DBS, you know, when we do surgery for any condition, there are a certain number of potential side effects that we always um, are watchful for and concerned about. Uh, and then when we're investigating a new disease state or a new target, we want to make sure that there's nothing above and beyond what we would otherwise expect to see in, in a population in terms of risk. 
Um, when we look at the adverse events that were reported within this registry, there's a couple of things that kind of um, that kind of uh, uh, can be looked at more closely. One is there seems to be a higher degree of infections. Uh, we're not sure exactly why this happens, but um, that is something to be aware of. Uh, and then there is a number of different stimulation-related side effects. This is always the case with any stimulation trial. Uh, the stimulation-related side effects are very dependent on which target we're talking about. And so you can see certain of these are more common in the GPI target compared to the thalamic target. Uh, and I would say that these are probably not unexpected, but certainly things to be aware of as we're approaching the care of patients. And then the last thing I'll say about that is that there have been other separate uh, reports of the neuropsychological outcomes of DBS uh, in Tourette patients, and, and across the board, they show that there are none, uh, meaning that patients do not experience cognitive decline, they do not experience worsening of their OCD, their ADHD, or other uh, comorbidities. Uh, and so just in summary, I will say this is, this is what we need to know. We know that from these small series, uh, both of cannabis and cannabinoids and also of deep brain stimulation, that there's definitely a signal. We know that people can improve, especially when they have uh, failed other therapies in the case of deep brain stimulation. Uh, in the case of cannabinoids, we know that there is potential for um, adverse effects, and we have to be very cautious about this, especially when we think about their use in uh, children and adolescents. And with the case of deep brain stimulation, there remain several unanswered questions about the best target, uh, about the patients who might have the best results, and how we really should study this response uh, in more detail to really understand how patients improve. And in both cases, really more, more research and larger studies are needed, and certainly better design studies are needed in order to um, get the answers to these important questions. And so they remain uh, investigational at this time. And so with that, I'll conclude. I'm going to turn this back um, to uh, Angela so we can either uh, field questions or we can um, talk about how to uh, take those and, and answer them. Thank you all for such an excellent presentation. Unfortunately, this is all the time that we have for the session. It's a lot of excellent content to get through in one hour, so we apologize for not being able to get to your questions right now. However, all of the questions that have been asked are recorded and I will make sure to send them to our presenters and they will get you your answers within the next few days. So thank you for such great questions um, and thank you for such a wonderful presentation. If you do still have questions, feel free to ask them in the next few minutes while I wrap it up. Um, so I do want to mention also that the, once the session is closed, you will receive a survey on the presentation. It would be greatly appreciated if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within the next few hours to view a link of the recording of the session. Additionally, the session will be posted on the TAA's YouTube channel for those who are unable to participate today. As I mentioned earlier, the slides are available under the handouts section on the control panel as well. The EU credits have been made available for this session also at an additional fee. You can visit Tourette.org for more information on that. Lastly, we encourage you to reach out to us about this virtual conference or for any ideas and suggestions you may have. This presentation was presented free of charge thanks to our generous don donors. If you appreciated the session, we welcome you to support the organization. Any amount will help. Visit us at Tourette.org to learn more and to donate. On behalf of the Tourette Association, thank you again for joining us and taking the time to view our presentation. Thank you to our wonderful presenters. And as I mentioned, we will get to your questions. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day, and please join us for some of the other sessions happening today. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.